Behind Enemy Lines, The Dangers of the Libertarian Party. Originally published on July 10th, 2015 at libertyunderattack.com and read to you by the author. Consistent libertarians hold two philosophical axioms above all else. Those two are the non-aggression principle, which forbids all initiatory force, and the self-ownership axiom, which upholds private property rights and the ownership of one's body. If one is going to call themselves a libertarian, they must put those two philosophies first, or in all honesty, they aren't libertarians. My conscience, conscience has made me realize that being involved in the political process at all is a violation of both of the principles that consistent philosophical libertarians like myself deem extremely important. First off, the state is inherently anti propertarian because in order to allegedly protect our property rights, they must first violate our property rights. They express this in many ways, such as property taxes, their use of eminent domain and nuisance abatement, and the simple fact that they use force to deter, force to deter us from putting substances into our own bodies. Next, voting in and of itself is a violation of the non-aggression principle. When you enter a voting booth and scratch shit on paper, or push a button, you are violently forcing your beliefs and preferences upon others. Even if you're voting for the most consistent, liberty-minded candidate, you're still attempting to force freedom upon others. As Samuel Konkin mentioned in his 1980 New Libertarian Manifesto, quote, it is part of the statist mystique to confuse the necessity of ends means consistency. It is thus the most crucial activity of the libertarian theorist to expose inconsistencies. But we have attempted and most failed to describe the consistent means and ends combination of libertarianism, end quote. The Libertarian Party was founded in December of 1971, and since then they haven't accomplished anything. Their stated goal was to educate the people about true freedom, and winning elections was only a vehicle for spreading the message of liberty. Since their inception, we have only lost more freedoms, the government has only gotten bigger, and more Americans have become victims of democide and abuse. And their goal of education is almost a moot point, as they are teaching the gullible minarchists, that is, minimal status, that the political process and restoring the republic are the only realistic ways to win back their freedoms. But, most of all, the reason the LP is dangerous is because with its, with its involvement in the political process, it is giving legitimacy to the most dangerous superstition, the belief in authority and government. I mention these details about the LP because I have been going on political field trips these past few months. My first one was at a McLean County board meeting. Another trip involved dealing with, empl with the employees in the McLean County Government Center in order to cancel my voter registration. Next, I was coerced to serve on a jury, and the final field trip was when I spectated a few criminal court proceedings. I figured that a good way to conclude my political field trips was to attend a reformist meeting and experience those naive folks who think they can infiltrate the KKK and turn it into the NAACP. So, on Tuesday, July 7th, I attended my first, and last, Libertarian Party meeting. The so-called business meeting was at Buffalo, Buffalo Wild Wings at 6 p.m. I trundled on in and found the local LP chapter members on the back patio. There were four others there when I arrived, including Chris Michael, who was an aspiring political ruler. I took a seat, introduced myself, and then we began engaging in small talk. I was asked a few personal questions, one of which included if I had voted in the special election that took place earlier that day. I had to bite my tongue because I could not state that I had already canceled my voter registration last April. If I would have told him that, then there would have been no reason for me to be there, and I did not want to invite suspicion as to why I had chosen to attend that evening. I instead replied with an answer along the lines of, nope, I wasn't fond of any of the choices. Thankfully, that too was the response of the gentleman that asked me. Let's call this person John for the sake of his privacy. John noticed my Liberty Under Attack Voluntarist shirt and said, see that you're a voluntarist. It was just an observation, and from his reaction, I think he liked that fact. At that point, the LP members started discussing their political failures, and also those at the local GOP. As soon as I heard John's name, I immediately remembered seeing his signs around town from a year or two back when he was the aspiring political ruler. Nonetheless, I didn't expect to be back in my high school cafeteria, only this time with an adult beverage hearing the local LP chapter membership gossip about the GOP. They were extremely into mainstream politics. They knew the imaginary titles of every successful and aspiring political ruler, and they even had titles themselves. John mentioned that his wife was the chairman of the Second Continental Army of the Pacific Fleet, as well as the fact that she used to be vice chairman of the Lollipop Guild. I don't remember their official titles, so these parodies will have to do. 
safe to say then that they are fond of the partyarchy, which is the anti-concept of pursuing libertarian ends through status means that Konkin discussed back in the 80s. We'll return back to the titles momentarily. They were all genuinely nice people, and I did enjoy their company, even though I despised the fact that they were there to vet an aspiring political ruler to see if he was a potential candidate that the LP could endorse. After being there for about a half an hour, someone closer to my age entered and sat down. He was there to try to find other like-minded people, and he was very interested in joining the LP, which was evident since he drove 45 minutes to attend. At that point, the aspiring political ruler, Chris, stood up and gave his speech. He mentioned that he was a small business owner and enjoyed the freedom that it gave him, in comparison to being a corporate slave. He went on to do the, do the thing all politicians do and emphatically stated, I want to be your candidate. All I could think looking at him was, sit the fuck down already. It wasn't simply the fact that he was standing up. It was because he wants, to, he wants my support to throw his weight around by way of government coercion. I did throw up in my mouth a bit at that statement, but I maintained my composure and kept my ears open. At that point, three other members of this LP chapter showed up. There was an older, married couple and one committed, over-enthusiastic, over reformist Uber employee. At that point, it was question time for, John, for uh, Mr. Michael. John asked first, and of course, it was the cliché, Why should I vote for you? question. I don't remember the answer verbatim, but Michael responded with a cliché, vague answer, talking about how much he loves freedom and wants others to be free. John's wife then brought up the subject of social issues. I knew this was going to be interesting. The first one brought up was abortion. Brace yourselves. Michael took a page out of the pro-life Christian conservative handbook and proselytized about life beginning at conception. He believes abortion is murder and should be treated as such. I was taken aback, and I think a couple of the other LP chapter members were too. I think it's important here to point out an inconsistency in Michael's previous statements. If we look at the LP platform in section 1.5, we can see that he contradicted the party platform, which states, quote, Recognizing that abortion is a sensitive issue and that people can hold good faith views on all sides, we believe that government should be kept out of the matter, leaving the question to each person for their conscientious consideration, end quote. Instead of it being a personal decision left outside the realm of government, Michael would be happy with government intervention against a medical procedure, at least in this regard. To make matters worse and more confusing in trying to get a handle on this guy, the next topic was homosexual marriage in regards to the recent Supreme Court ruling. Michael believes that the government should have nothing to do with marriage and people should be left alone to do as they wish in the privacy of their homes. Obviously, I agree, but if that personal decision should be left out of the realm of the state, then why not abortion too? Well, I, th I think I have an answer. Michael isn't being consistent with the libertarian axiom of self-ownership, or even with his supposed policies either. He isn't judging his beliefs based, off, beliefs based off of the twin axioms of libertarianism. Rather, he's being arbitrary, and is basing it all off of how he feels. Maybe even upon the political expediency of the moment. At that point, Michael continued on and stated that in the last election, he ran for Secretary of State for Illinois and lost miserably, as well as mentioning his slogan for his campaign. He calls it Five for Freedom, and what he was suggesting is that everyone give him five dollars so that he can go off to D.C. and send libertarian shockwaves through the federal government. <laughs> as if that has ever worked. Another question was asked, and, if, and it was, if there's one thing you could change if you were elected, what would it be? This may have been the only answer I genuinely liked from the man, although his inconsistencies and ambition to be my political ruler makes that almost a moot point. He said that it would be prison incarceration, as that would be a multifaceted victory. He mentioned the war on drugs and firearms regulations, as well as self-ownership for the second time that evening. At that point, the uber-ambitious gentleman stood up and started talking. As with most of the reformists, he, he loved making people aware of how important he was since he is the chairperson of the goat herding division for McLean County. Titles of nobility much? After his stint of bra braggadocio, he started to talk about the successes of the LP since he took over his role. It was at this point that I knew for sure that these people weren't serious and that the LP was just a social club. The successes described consisted of walking in parades, designing floats, setting up booths at social events, and going to state fairs. So not only do they think they can infiltrate the state, but they also think they can win back our freedoms through social gatherings, somehow. The naivety was nothing less than astounding. 
I took a list of seven questions with me, and prior to that point, the LP was digging themselves a deep hole without me even, a me even having to bring anything up. I decided I would ask one question. Mr. Michael, how do you feel about intellectual property and the copyright clause found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution? That was the only real question that was asked that evening, and the LP chapter members, including Michael, were taken aback by my question. Michael mentioned that the question was too direct and to explain further. I mentioned the DMCA claims on YouTube and how copyright is being used as censorship. I also explained that as a journalist, YouTuber, and radio show host, I have to be careful because even with the fair use doctrine, people have still, people have still been outright censored, such as Christy Aphrodite of Soul Journeys Radio. He admitted that he didn't know anything about what I was explaining and pulled a lame answer out of his ass. Well, I think if you create something, you have the rights to it. That was pretty much the extent of it. I wasn't surprised that he was completely unaware of one of the more important aspects of the Constitution that he wants to restore, being a libertarian senatorial candidate. Expecting consistency and competency is completely irrational when it comes to reformism. It doesn't matter which of the various flavors of reformism it is. This also brings up another worrisome, worrisome point. Most political rulers that swear an oath to the Constitution don't even know what the document says. They don't know what the limits of their own powers are. That would be safe to say when it comes to Michael as well. It would be wise for Michael to know the document simply because it is the basis of the LP platform, but additionally, if Michael is running for the US Senate, he needs to know the ins and outs of the federal constitution, something he surely does not. Overall, it's just an issue of competency and Michael is incompetent. After I asked him that question, Michael and I began talking. He asked me what I did and this is the point where I dropped some of my, some of my vagueness and told him. He was interested in checking out my work so I gave him a business card. The other adult my age asked for a business card and joined in on the in the conversation. I told them the type of things we discuss in LUA radio, minus the anarchic topics, of course. The adult my age started talking about radio hosts, authors, and philosophers that he enjoys. He mentioned Bob Murphy from the uh, Mises Institute, Stefan Molyneux, and a couple of others, which surprised the hell out of me. He's certainly been looking around for a proper libertarian education, something he surely won't learn from the LP. Of course, Michael didn't know any of those folks, and, rec and I recommended Samuel Konkin to him, more specifically the 1985 debate between Konkin and Robert Poole, the founder of Reason Magazine, titled, What is a Libertarian? Maybe then, he would learn that he isn't truly a libertarian. I stuck around for about a half an hour longer, and the meeting came to a close. John came up to me and invited me to their upcoming events and asked if I would be back to another meeting. Since they're all nice people, I was civil and just said, I think you will. Don't get me wrong, it was an outright lie, but I wasn't necessarily in the mood for a conflict or a debate. Larkin Rose wrote an article in September of 2010 titled, Libertarian Party Worthless. In this article, Rose states, quote, The Libertarian Party has ceased to be libertarian. They don't dare to, be bluntly, dare to bluntly describe what libertarianism entails, because that would scare too many potential voters who have been thoroughly indoctrinated into the cult of state worship. Instead of speaking about succinct, specific principles, Libertarian candidates and spokesfolk muddle around in more publicly acceptable generalities. They want less of this and more of that. Less than what? More than what? What is the ultimate goal? What is the underlying principle? End quote. As I mentioned in the introduction, libertarianism is the synthesis of the non-aggression principle and the axiom of self-ownership. As I've also emphasized, consistency is everything. If one is going to call themselves a libertarian, then their actions must coincide with the overall philosophy of libertarianism. And if, then they are hypocrites and are more than likely members of the anti-libertarian libertarian party. In the two hours I met with, with the local LP chapter, I heard them mention self-ownership twice. But there wasn't a single mention of the non-aggression principle. Now I'm sure some of you will think this is rather harsh criticism, and you might even want to accuse me of hurting the movement. As some have been accused of in the past. But I am compelled by my conscience to call out inconsistencies, hypocrisies, and everyone must recognize the LP for what it is. Dangerous. The only way the state can exist is through hallucinatory tendencies, such as being involved in the political process or by the belief in the myth of authority at all. The LP is only furthering the hallucination by giving it legitimacy. In addition to all of their massive failures since its inception. There's also an opportunity cost issue here. If they would reallocate all of the time and resources they, they dedicate in the political process and to other things that actually work, or at least have a much higher possibility of working, then maybe we could regain our freedoms in, in a more timely manner, such as through the economic means. 
From my experiences with, with LP members in the past and from this political field trip experience, it is safe to say that the Libertarian Party is libertarian leaning, and even then, only on a good day. I will leave you, this, I'll leave you with this quote by St. Bernard of Clairvaux, which succinctly sums up their actions. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. You've just heard Behind Enemy Lines, The Dangers of the Libertarian Party, originally published at libertyunderattack.com on July 10th, 2015, and read to you by the author. For an in-depth follow-up discussion, make sure to tune into the July 12th broadcast of LUA Radio at fprnradio.com slash libertyunderattack.